Brother Jonathan's text, is, as has been said, Jude 1, verse 24, and I'm going to also read verse 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. 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 Brethren, we do have a need to be kept while we're living in this world. God is able to keep us from falling. There are many dangers that we will face in this journey through this life. And our enemy, we do have an enemy. He will seek to deceive us and to pull us off of the path. And so we have a need for one to come and strengthen us and enable us to not be pulled aside. We have a shepherd that guides us, and that protects us from the wolves that would come and tear us away from the flock. And God has made provision through this shepherd for us to not be overcome. In Christ, this protection is available by faith. There is a place of safety, and it is within Christ, a haven from the storm where we can find protection, where we can receive nourishment and be kept and sustained. If we are to receive the good things that have been provided, we must remain within the circumference of his care. Yeah, amen. God is able to keep us from falling out of that place. We are told in Galatians to walk in the spirit. This is how God keeps us from falling. He enables us to walk in the spirit. And while doing so, we are in an environment where sin can have no expression. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we are walking in the Spirit, we are in a, we are in a place where there is much light. Yes. This light is what enables us to walk with confidence. 1 John 1.7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. It is within this circumference of light that we're able to see the things that are before us. When we can see what is before us, and we have been given nimble feet, feet that are able to quickly step over the dangers or go around them without being tripped up, then we can successfully maneuver through the precarious and dangerous circumstances that life will throw at us. 2 Samuel 22, verse 34 says, He maketh my feet like hind's feet, and setteth me upon my high places. So he changes us so that we're able to endure the elements. Amen. Our theme in this festival is the immutability of God. Now, since God does not change, and he is able to keep us from falling now, then we can say with confidence that there will never be a time when he will cease being able to keep us. There will never be a time when we cannot trust in him to keep us and to deliver us before his presence faultless. We, have, we can have complete confidence in the immutable God that he will always do as he has promised. Amen. And in closing, Psalm 66, verses 8 through 9. Oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. Brethren, it's a true honor to be able to speak about the keeping power of God towards his saints. Like for those who are living in Christ, I mean, this truth is a gem, very of great value, one that's not quickly forgotten or ignored. It is worthy of constant remembrance and attention. And that, it's good to remember, we're here where we are now because God has kept us to that point. You see, that's how Jude introduced, closes. He says, now unto him... Now he could, I guess he could have easily said, Thou unto God be glory. 
Well, that's not. He, he, he tells you a little more about who he's, who he's speaking to. This is the one who keeps us from falling. To him who is able to keep us from falling. It's good to speak of God in this manner. Remind people who God is. Amen. What God's doing. Yes. What credit, credit things to God. Be glory and dominion forever. Amen. And we get into this need, this keeping, this keeping power. I like to have an understanding of what we mean when we say it. Well, what Lord means when he says he keeps us. When we go over passages like this, unfortunately, due to a lot of sloppy teaching on the subject, men tend to take this passage in some very erroneous ways, very erroneous directions. And I know so many of us have heard the once saved, always saved doctrine, which some men teach to mean that once we've made that initial entrance into the kingdom, that there's no danger. That's like easy sailing from that point on. There's no danger. We're guaranteed entrance in the kingdom of God regardless of how we live our lives or what we do from that point on. Now, I've heard men say this, you know, like, God's going to save me whether I sin or not. I mean, people speak that boldly. But to me, this would be like a runner saying, I'm going to win this race. Even if I quit running, I'm going to win the race. <laughs> well, it's the, same, it's the same thing. It is. And it doesn't work. If someone's going to get to heaven regardless of how they live and act and think, then I imagine this would be like tying someone up and making them go. I think bound would be a better word to use here than keep. God's able to bind us to heaven. Well, that's not the word he used, though. He said keep. You might think of infants in a car seat. They're not going to stay put, so you've got to tie them up with, with buckles they can't loose until, so they can stay put till you get to your destination. Well, that's not how salvation is. And, you know, children aren't always quiet in the car seat either. They kick and scream the whole trip sometimes. Well, that's not what we do on the way to glory. Rather, we're not bound, not in that sense. We're kept. And there's a difference between the two. If, in fact, we're not in danger, then this passage does produce a serious problem for us. The fact that we are kept makes it evident that danger is present and that it is near. What did Jesus say? He said, beware of false prophets yes. yeah. who, come in, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Watch out, he says. Yeah. Watch out. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes peeled. It's not evident who these people are. They'll sneak right in and take you if you're not looking. What else did he say? He said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware. There it is again. Look out. Paul says, beware of dogs. Beware yeah. of evil workers. Yeah. Beware of concision. Some of the other, another, there's another rendering of that, but it's not put pretty. It says, beware those who insist on cutting the body. That's what their substitute for concision is. But let's not stop there. He says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Beware. And then Peter adds, Beware, lest ye also, being led away with, by the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Beware. There's many bewares there. Warnings about these things should make it evident that you do in fact have exposure to them, otherwise the warning is pointless. In addition to that, we have the devil, a roaring lion, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for someone to kill. You have that. You also have... Prince, he's also referred to as the prince of the power of the air and the god of this world. That's who you have against you now. We also have principalities and powers and dark places to deal with. And we also are in process of being made new, which means we're not completely made new yet. And we still yet have sinful passions and lusts that we must struggle with due to having another law in our members warring against the law of our mind. You have that to deal with too. So with all these things against you, do you really want to have to do this on your own? I mean, doesn't this sound all the more sweet when you see like what's stacked up against you here? God can, God's able to keep me. I don't have to do this by myself. I don't have to face this alone by my own frail lack of strength. This is a good word to have when you consider these things. Now, also consider how other versions have worded this part of the passage, the keep. He's able to keep you. These are the only ones I've found. Most of them read the same, but the only variances you'll find is he'll guard you, he'll protect you, preserve you, and help you. Now, based on these renderings, you can conclude that God's keeping us by giving us strength that we don't have in and of ourselves. And he's protecting us from foes that, we're not, that are far stronger than we are on our own. Man did not stand against the devil when in a morally perfect state. And I refer to Adam when I said that. He didn't even stand then. So how then can man expect to stand in a sinful state? 
You see, these foes, they're aggressive to take you from the Lord. They're not sitting by. They're not casual about this. They're giving their all, every ounce of their being, into overthrowing your faith. Christ even spoke of false Christs and prophets that rise up and deceive many, adding that if it were possible, even the very elect. Now, if it were possible, of course, means that this cannot happen. However, this does not mean that the elect, the elect are just of themselves a superior type of people that are in of themselves strong, like a superior race of people. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no. If that's the impression people are getting, then they're dead wrong. This means that if it were not for the keeping power of God himself, the elect would be swept away like everyone else. Yes, amen. The point is that God's keeping his people from falling. That's what Jesus is saying. Amen. They're going to rise up, but God's going to keep them safe. Amen. God's not going to let them get deceived. He'll protect them from these false Christs. Now you might consider Job, who some might see a crude example, but there is a valid point here. God told Satan, save, that is spare, save his life. Save his life. Now when Satan was set loose against Job to do his damage, he had restrictions. Amen. He could only go so far, only as far as God said he could go. Uh -huh. right. Even though it appears that Job was being overcome, God was keeping him. Amen. The devil could only do so much. And how many times could the Lord have said the same concerning you? Save his life. Don't do that though. You can do this, but that's all you can do. I mean, it kind of gives you an idea of how God's working with us and how God is keeping us, how we've made it this far. We've had probably, I could say, God has kept us in a similar fashion. He's had us. He's protected us. I therefore take kept in this sense to refer to protection. Like you think guard in some sense. Like, like protect, it means if someone's coming at you, someone's there to stand in the way and hinder them from getting at them. Yes. Like you put your hand in the way or something like that. Like it brings a halt to the attack so to speak, mm. or even like a shield. He said that to Abraham, I am your shield. Mm. Yeah. He's our shield too. What did David say? He said, thou art, my, thou art my high and mighty tower. Thou art my strength. A tower, that's like a place I can flee for refuge. Yeah. A place I can find safety. A tower is strong. Large artillery weapons cannot take them down. The Lord is my high and mighty tower. He keep, that's, that's like a, a way of saying he's the keeper, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And also, in the sense of preservation. <clears throat> like preserve, like if you preserve something, it means you keep it fresh. You keep it from becoming, like in food, and, food that needs to be preserved in a way to where it doesn't rot. It doesn't become stale. It doesn't like become bland over time. And so the Lord, well, he keeps us from rotting too. We stay fresh. We stay clean. We stay pure. We stay desirable and pleasant in his eyes. As the song says, he keeps us safe from all harm in his sheltering arms. See, the writer of that song had this in, had this in mind. The Lord keeps. Men have, this need, men have what they need in Christ Jesus. And we know from experience there is no safer place than to be in him. Amen. Now, even in times as early as David, he certainly had this down. He said, the Lord protects us. The Lord keeps us. He said, listen to the things that he said. He said, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. What's that? That's the words of a man who knows that God is his keeper. He also said, He delivered, delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. And last he says, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. We'll see, we can pray these kind of prayers too. Because God keeps. We can pray that way. May we pray similar prayers as we continue to fight the good fight of faith. Lord, keep me from mine enemies. Keep me from being overthrown. Protect me from their wicked ways and devices. Keep me, Lord. Now, God has demonstrated man's need to be kept. I mean, in case anyone's wondering, like, does everyone need this? Well, this is, this is true. Everyone has had to be kept. This has been demonstrated from the very beginning when man was created that man needs to be kept. Adam and Eve were both the most morally perfect people that ever walked the earth. They were completely innocent, and for a time they were clean in the eyes of God. However, when faced with temptation, Adam fell very quickly. The temptation was not even one that might, one might consider was like a very offensive crime or disgusting crime. It was just eating a piece of fruit from one tree. God said not to eat in a garden full of other trees that they could eat freely from. You would have thought, 
from one perspective, this would be a cinch. Consider the advantages. He didn't say, you can't eat from any tree but this one. He said, there's only one tree out of many trees that you, can, that you can't eat from. You can eat any of these other trees that you want. Yeah. Mm. And you think, well, they see, with all these other things they can eat, there's no way they're even going to like bother with that, right? I mean, it looked like from one perspective, this would be a walk in the park for them, but it wasn't. You see, the Satan, the serpent, comes along, and he deceives Eve into eating that fruit, convincing her that it won't result in death after all. You're not going to die. You hear people tell us, like, oh, come on. That's not going to happen. Go ahead and try it. They talk this way today. Even in the business world, like, they have people like this that they try to like, lure you in, like, oh, come on. I know you've heard that, but that's not true. We all know that's not true. Go ahead and try. You'll see. You'll see. And you'll be like, the God's knowing good and evil, he says, too. Might I add, it didn't take much for Eve to be deceived. It didn't. It didn't take much to change her mind. You know, people have these debates for hours and hours and hours on end. They still don't change their minds. Well, that wasn't what happened with Eve. It didn't take hours and hours and hours of debate and convincing to get her to eat that fruit. It just took one lie. You won't die. You won't. So she eats it. But then Adam, unlike his wife, was not deceived, according to Paul's epistle to Timothy. He said Adam was not deceived. He did say that. And so he eats the fruit anyway, despite what he has been told concerning the consequences of doing so. So even while in a morally perfect state, man couldn't keep even the simplest of commandments from the Lord, not even resisting a piece of fruit hanging on a tree. Couldn't keep himself. In this, we see a very clear picture of our own frailties of, as a man. On our own, we cannot stand. We cannot follow through on our own. We clearly see here that sin does indeed easily beset. But what did God demonstrate in Adam and Eve here? Men need to be kept. That's what he showed us here. He showed us how well man stands on his own. And how. And he, don't take no how he demonstrated that. He demonstrated it with people who had a moral perfection and innocence that none of us in this room have ever had. The most moral people that ever walked here. That's who he demonstrated it with. So if they can't, you can rest assured, you sure can't. But let's not stop there, though. We have other records of those who have fallen. What about those angels that fell? Was Satan not perfect in his ways in the day that he was created? Was he not an anointed cherub? Yes. Yet in all his beauty, iniquity was found in him. In a state of perfection, he determined himself to be like the Most High. A war then waged in heaven, and Michael the archangel successfully overpowered the devil and his angels who he had gotten aside with them, a third of all heaven. That's a lot. That's a lot of influence. But now these angels are bound to everlasting chains of destruction, never to be made, never to be made whole again, and someday be cast in a lake of fire for their betrayal of the God who made them. Amen. These angels, though, were not evil when God created them, and neither was the, neither was the devil. Yeah. They weren't evil when they were created. Yeah. They became evil. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they fell. Now to get to the point, if man in a moral state of moral perfection and innocence, can't stand on his own, and angels in heaven, created perfect, can't stand on their own, how much less can men who are by nature wicked, sinful, defiled, unclean, and weak stand on their own? Yeah. These things are revealed, you know, in Genesis to teach us origin, like where man came from, or where the devil came from, and why we're created, but it's also to teach us that we need God if we're going to make it. Yeah. We need him in order to be saved, and we need him to be we need him to help us stand on our feet after we're saved too. Man was never made with the intention of being able to live independent of God's help. Now, although I did touch on the need to be kept, I do want to touch more on this keep you from falling, though. That's a good thing to, to consider. Now, there's two ways you look at that. First, there's like falling like you might trip or something. You, don't, you fall, but you don't perish. And then there's falling like you fall off a cliff. You die. <laughs> there are the various ways you can look at that. But if you look, think about it, the way people talk today, it seems as if this truth about the Lord has been completely forgotten or omitted altogether. I mean, you read that. God's able to keep you from falling. People say, well, we're just like those old Israelites. Or you know how we are. Or we fall down, but God always helps us back on our feet. And then you read this, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not really seeing the connection here. Not to be humorous, but if I were to say, well, you know what? Oh, don't worry, God can keep you from falling. Well, sorry, you know what? That didn't make sense because I just fell. 
that's what this that's what I see here when you talk that way. You don't quote passages like this while you're crawling on your belly on the ground. You're on the ground like God's able to keep you from falling. Not he's just going to keep getting me back up after a fall. He can keep he can stop the falling process altogether. Amen. See words like that that's people who are constantly falling. Like, why do, people, why do churches need recovery programs? Because they have people that are falling on the ground all the time, crawling around on the ground. Allow me to cite what other, how other versions rendered this to show just how odd this may sound in our modern culture. This keep you from falling. One version says he'll guard you from stumbling. You won't trip at all. Like, you even walk down the road, it's just like, watch your step. You'll see something like that. Or like, dip. They'll give you an upside so you can, like, prepare, so you won't, like, be taken off or he'll preserve you without sin keep you without sin keep you on your feet keep you from falling into sin like you've fallen into a pit he'll keep you from that keep you upright and here's one that people would probably find unbelievable it says keep you from doing anything wrong well that's what the spirit says God can keep you from all of these things when reading these, there are a variety of these that come to mind, but you know, like they, some say like he keeps you from sin in general, and some say like he keeps you from utterly perishing. Well, see, well both are true. He keeps you from falling in any sense. Any sense. That's right. Of course, sinning is compared to falling or stumbling. However, God can keep us from that power of sin. You might remember Abimelech, you know, he took Abraham's wife, Sarah, to himself. And well, <laughs> someone had to intervene. That's right. What do you say in that dream? You're a dead man. Dead man. I remember that hit home to pretty much all of us at one point. It's like, you're a dead man. <laughs> but then Abimelech gives the explanation. He's like, I didn't know. I didn't know. And he said, he knew it was from the integrity of your heart. He said, but I withheld thee from sinning. Yeah. Well, brethren, God can withhold you too if you're trusting in him. Yeah. If you're living for God and you have your abode in Christ, God can keep you from being entangled in iniquity. Keep you out of the trap, so to speak. Good thing to ponder. Let no man therefore glory in his own ability on this matter. But if you overcome sinful passions and lusts, praise the Lord that God gave you the grace to do so. You were able to do it because of him. Also, those who are kept by God, they don't utterly perish. They will not be overcome in the end. We know this condition of no recovery, the state where it's impossible to be renewed again to repentance. That warning's in Hebrews. But... When you know of that condition, these words in our main passage sound all the more sweeter. God's able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep you out of that pit. Amen. If a person were to fall away, you know, in the sense used in Scripture, I know we use that a variety of ways, but in the Scripture, when someone falls away, that person's beyond help. Falling away isn't just falling in a pit. It's being in the pit and it's cutting the rope that's lowered down to you as a means of escape. That's falling away. Falling away is not taking a step near the edge of the cliff. It's falling off the cliff. It is not being poisoned, it is becoming poisoned and then destroying the cure, leaving you with no hope of healing. That's falling away in the scripture. But God keeps you from that condition. Yes. Amen. Jesus told the parable of that lamb that left the 99, did he not? That lamb was kept from perishing. Amen. The wicked one didn't snatch it away. Christ kept it. He brought it back. He restored it. And we trust that the good shepherd will protect us as well from being devoured by beasts that frequently circle around us waiting for that kill, waiting for that one to wander away. Christ will keep you from that. So we say, praise the Lord, we who have such a good provision in Christ Jesus that we're not left to run the race alone, but we have a means to make it to the end without spot. Just like the scriptures say, the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now those are comforting words. He makes you unmovable and he keeps evil from like just blowing you over or uprooting. You won't be uprooted, so to speak. As long as God's got his grip, like, well, like Jesus said, no one could take him from my hand. Amen. Kept. Well, I mean, the hand's up. You think, like, well, the hand's not open. <laughs> the hand is closed. That's why they can't take you. <laughs> You're protected. Now, after, you know, just to wrap things up, after hearing these things, men might get a little confused and say things, well, I mean, I mean it kind of irritates me to have to say this, but, you know, you gotta take you got to take this into account. They say, well, we can't just sit around and expect God to defend us. we got to do something, too. They'll say stuff like that. And well, there is true. There is involvement on our part. 
just to list some things that God tells us to do. He says, put on the armor of God, resist the devil, stand fast, hold fast, run the race, walk circumspectly, fight the good fight of faith, flee youthful lusts, beware of false prophets, and be of a sound mind. See, that's what God tells you to do. So when people read things like this, they think, well, is God keeping us or are we keeping ourselves? The answer is yes. Both are true. The armor you put on, where did you get it? How did you know how to use it? That sound of mind that you have, where did that come from? Did you always have that? How do you run in the race if you're not in the race? And if in the race, how do you know where the finish line is? How did you know you were in danger at all? These are things that are attributed to God. These aren't things that you naturally just arrived at. We keep ourselves from harm through the provision of God himself. God empowers us to overcome, and it's not by our own strength, but by the strength he gives us. So even in what we do, the keeping is still accredited to God. Amen. These provisions are only available in Christ, and they can only be used when in Christ. So we certainly do not want to neglect the Lord Jesus on this matter. I say abide in him, remain in him at all times, and you will be strong enough. God will see to it. You see, we have this word from the Lord. He's like, God is able. That's how he opens it. That's a word that's intended to produce trust in our God. There is none greater than him. And there's none that can stop him from accomplishing this. Amen. If God says he will keep his people, then as long as I'm in him, God will carry that promise out. Because he is, as we have stated, wow. immutable. He will preserve you spotless till the day of judgment. As long as you cling to his son and abide in him, trust in him, and adhere to his teaching. God is immutable. He keeps his promises. He will keep his promises people from evil. The question is, do we believe this? Amen.